Yeah, so exactly. So, so um, yeah, like you said, I'm a PhD student at Stanford. And all this work I'll be talking about is joint work with my friend with Percy. Um, and I'd also just like to give a shout out to some of my other great collaborators, Pranav and Braden, also at Stanford. Um, so this talk is all about uh, reading comprehension, and in particular, reading comprehension question answering. Um, so just an example, so this is the type of stuff I've been reading about since I'm uh, new to Seattle this summer. Uh, so, you know, I might pull up Wikipedia and read about the San Juan Islands, for example, which are famous for their orca whales. Um, and given a paragraph, you know, some reasonable question might be something like, you know, what fish is food for some of the whales uh, in the San Juan Islands? And of course, you would want a reading comprehension question answering system to be able to find that the correct answer in this case is the salmon. Um, so there's been a ton of uh, really great interest in this task of reading comprehension question answering. Um, uh, I was, I was uh, lucky enough to be able to co-organize this workshop just at ACL uh, about this very task. Um, and I think one thing that's been really cool is there's been uh, such a growth of data sets been coming out, you know, including, of course, from, from here with, with data sets like ARC. Um, and, and in turn, this has led to uh, really this like giant race of uh, Mars for Progress to just take an example from, from work from our group, uh, where we introduced Squad back in 2016, and we've seen over the last two years has been really a, a, an impressive amount of progress, and, and so on this plot, each dot is a separate submission to the test set um, on Squad, so you can see, A, just the number of submissions has been um, very impressive, and also the fact that there's been this slow but, but very steady convergence where we're now approaching human level performance um, on the Cephalon score. And in fact, back in January, uh, there were a couple of systems, one from MSR and one from Alibaba, that actually surpassed uh, human level performance on, a, on another one of the evaluation metrics for squad, which led to headlines like this, uh, robots are better at reading than humans. Uh, this was actually <laughs> tweeted out by Alibaba. Uh, it came from USA Today. Um, but, but I mean, I think we can all in this room certainly agree that, that they're very far from this. So here's just one example of, of a, some sort of a reality check you might be able to do. Uh, so here's an example that I just already took directly from Squad, uh, and just to recap, so the format for all the, all the examples from the original Squad data set is that you're given a question, which is written by crowd workers, you get a paragraph, which uh, comes from Wikipedia, uh, and you have to give the correct answer, which is guaranteed to be like an exact word or phrase uh, that appears in the paragraph. And so here, this is a relatively uh, simple question. Uh, most models, uh, most state-of-the-art models can find that the correct answer here is 1700. Uh, but now, let, let, let's, let's see what happens if we just add this other sentence to the end of the paragraph, right? So this, par this sentence clearly doesn't actually answer the question, right? It's talking about some other random group of colonists. Um, but it turns out, uh, if you just add this sentence, many state-of-the-art systems are now going to predict this sort of random year we had at 1675 instead of the correct year, right? So here's an example where these models are clearly not, um, not able to understand that this sentence, even though it sort of looks somewhat related to the question, it actually has, has nothing to do with it. Um, so this is sort of going to be sort of overall the idea of this talk. Um, you know, we've been, we've been seeing stuff about human level, but I think thinking about how we're actually evaluating really matters, right? So you, systems may be human level, but like at, on what test, on what benchmarks are they actually be human level, right? That's, that's very important. And, and we need to think about what are the correct sort of metrics we want to use to actually incentivize the sort of progress that we want. So I'm going to talk about sort of three, um, three pieces of work I've been doing uh, in this realm. So first we'll talk about just these sorts of adversarial distracting sentences that I just showed. Um, I'll talk about the new version of Squad that we just released at ACL this year, which adds unanswerable questions, it's sort of a, a new challenge. Um, and then I'll talk about some work in progress that we've been thinking about relating to how you can generate additional sort of interesting test cases by taking other tasks and converting them into question answering. Cool, let's start with these uh, adversarial distractors, um, as I just showed you before. Uh, so this was work back in 2017, and we were really inspired uh, at the time by the work in computer vision. So here's a picture I'm sure many of you have seen before. Uh, if you take this panda and you add some very carefully chosen, very small amount of noise, um, you can now convince some state-of-the-art uh, object recognition system to believe that this is actually a given with very, very high confidence. Um, and so, so like sort of the key takeaway that's going on in the vision case is that we know that local perturbations, or basically if you change any pixel by a very small amount, uh, it basically has no chance of actually changing what the image uh, is showing. Uh, but models are really, really sensitive to these small differences, and therefore you can make these imperceptible changes and get them to make uh, wildly differing 
predictions. Um, and there's been some examples of, of this, uh, especially in the last year, of, of what I would like to call oversensitivity in NLP. Uh, so there's character level attacks you could do, like, okay, maybe let's try to change one letter and introduce some weird typo, but we'll pick that typo in a way that um, now the system maybe got the original question right, but this be question wrong. Um, and there's also some been, been a lot of interesting work uh, that's using various paraphrasing techniques, especially via uh, back translation from uh, machine translation algorithms. Uh, so for example, if you change what to which, sometimes that can uh, make the systems give a different answer. Or maybe you can paraphrase more syntactically, right? So if the system got the original question right, if you sort of flip these two clauses, maybe now it'll, it'll get screwed up. Um, but I guess what, what we're getting at in these distracting sentences, I guess this, this other phenomenon, which is that unlike in images, actually most local per perturbations do in fact alter semantics, right? So if you think about this, if you change you know, one word of a sentence, most of the time that will actually change, um, change what that sentence is saying. Um, so you know, this isn't really an oversensitivity story, I would say it's more of what we call an overstability type of story. So <laughs> you can imagine that we have, might have a sentence here that actually does answer the question. And then we just change one or two words uh, to words that, you know, if you might think, for example, in word vector space, these antonyms might be close together, these different uh, proper nouns might be close together. Um, but the model is overly stable to the fact that, like, even though these words are kind of related, uh, the sentence now means a completely different thing from that sentence before. Uh, okay, so now I'll just go into a little about, like, what how actually did we construct these distracting sentences. And we'll start with, again, the case we just saw, which is these grammatical distracting sentences that we just append to the end of the paragraph. Um, so the algorithm is, in fact, very simple. It's, it's basically a high level. We just have some rule-based system that takes a look at the question and the answer and tries to guess, like, what is a sentence that might look like it answers the question, but also <laughs> make sure that it doesn't actually answer it. OK, so the first and sort of most important step is we just change uh, entities, uh, numbers, and also replace uh, antonyms with other antonyms that are found in WordNet. And so this basically generates a now a new question, which again looks similar to the original, uh, but means something different. Um, we're also going to generate like a fake answer. So basically, we want to have something, some sort of thing that looks like an answer again to distract the system. Um, and we convert these into a declarative sentence. This is just based on some rules over the constituency parse. Um, and finally, we'll just have crowd workers fix these errors, right? And so, uh, again, so our new sort of idea for evaluation is going to be that we're going to take these sentences uh, for each of the examples in the development set, just append them to the end of the paragraph, and see how much does the model accuracy decrease when we add in this one distracting sentence to the end. Um, to do that, we, we took uh, four sort of development systems, because these are, these are systems that we were sort of query, querying a lot. Uh, during the development of this process, and these were sort of state-of-the-art models at the time we were doing the work. Um, and you see across the board, even if you just add this one sentence, uh, the accuracies go down quite a lot. So, so at the time, this best model was getting about 80% F1 um, squad. And just by doing this one uh, sentence trick, uh, we're now down to like 47% accuracy. So there, there's a huge drop. Uh, meanwhile, we also just measured how humans do, and, and the difference is like much smaller, right? They, they get like 3% more errors, but, but it's, it's very small. Uh, there's actually one sort of simple optimization you can do here, which is, um, as I said, the last step is that you know, crowd workers fix the errors that, because sometimes our like, rules to generate these declarative sentences are slightly off. Uh, and we just have multiple crowd workers uh, do the same thing. We'll get like slight variations, essentially, of this original distracting sentence. Um, right? And like, basically, any of these, if any of these uh, confuses the model, then we can, I think, confidently say that the model has, has failed at understanding. And so now we're just going to pick the worst case sentence over um, all of these, and it's like up to five sentences, right? So it's not, not a, yes, sir, question. Sorry, um, so just to clarify, yes. you trained on squad, but just used these oh. as test. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I should have, I should have clarified it. Yeah, so the model is, this is, this, currently these, are, these things are only happening at test time. We, the model just trained on the original. Um, okay, yeah, and so we see that uh, once you do that, uh, now we're looking at accuracies in like the mid-30s or something uh, coming down from the original 80%. Uh, 
and, and uh, of course, you know, these are systems, those results are on systems that we were sort of looking at a lot during development, but then we also took uh, 12 other systems, which uh, sort of, a lot of which sort of came out while we were doing this work. Uh, and it was, we just like ran these, again, you know, trained on the original squad, test on these, the version that has these distracting sentences added in. Um, and across the board, right, these, these sentences, even though we never looked at them while constructing these sentences, uh, these, these are also doing quite badly, right? So they're still, uh, for example, this VEST system goes from like 81% accuracy to about 40. Um, a couple of interesting things to note here. Uh, one is that uh, the sort of sort order of the systems doesn't stay the same, right? So according to the normal dev set, uh, this like mnemonic reader model was not the best, but it's actually doing quite a bit better than the other systems on the adversarial data. Um, and that was actually sort of an interesting observation for us. This was one of the like, early systems that was doing some form of self-attention uh, to, to encode the paragraph. And so it seems like that might be doing something to help out uh, manage long-range dependencies, which then might be useful in weeding out sort of these distracting sentences. Um, another observation was that uh, this isn't just like a thing about deep learning systems. So most of the things on the leaderboard are, are deep learning, but there's also this logistic regression baseline from the original squad paper. And that model is doing, I mean, it was much worse to begin with, but it also sees a similar sort of drop in performance uh, when you add these adversarial things. So it seems like it's not just, just a property of deep learning models, but just any model that was, that was trained on this data is, is suffering from this issue. Um, and in fact, even if we go back, uh, as I said in the beginning, there were some models from, from earlier this year that were able to match sort of human level on, on the task, and even those are sort of doing much worse. I was just wondering what the number in the bottom right was because you were standing in front of it. Sorry. Oh, sorry. They're 23. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so, sorry. So, so even these state of the art models, uh, <coughs> while the gap between the human performance on the original score is not very small, uh, the gap with humans is much larger on this adversarial data. Um, so, like, what's, what's going on here? Like, this was, this was like, I, I think, pretty, pretty interesting that. Consistently, we, we find that these models are weak to basically the exact same type of, of adversarial example. Right? All these models are in particular they're distracted by sentences that only have a partial match with the question. Right? So, some of the words, like you know, for in this example, some of the words like you know, declined after a year, right, are the same. And it seems like that's sort of enough for the model, and it doesn't care that these other words like Huguenot are not found in the sentence. Um, and I think some of the answer is that like the, the, the signal like the signal that partial matches are useful is actually there in the data. Um, so if you're if you're just trying to, to like fi figure out the correct answer, right? Like one sort of simple way to think about it is okay. Let's first identify all the things that might be good answers, which are in this case like all the years, uh, and then we see like which year actually seems to be close to a bunch of words that are important to the question, right? And so 1700 seems close to like the most words, uh, and, and therefore you would imagine that the system is actually being told to learn to like rank this higher, despite the fact that, that these other words like Huguenot and Settle are farther away, right? That's what it just gets, gets outweighed here. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it seems like a question of, of what sort of data now do we need to sort of force the models to learn this sort of holistic thing that, you know, you actually need to match uh, every part of the question to every part. Um, of some supporting evidence. Okay, so so that was that was all for adding grammatical sentences, um, and the next step we were we were sort of curious about was so we, we've explored this very small fraction of like things you might be able to add to the end of a paragraph. Um, what if we sort of uh, take take the chains off and say like what if just try to add any ungrammatical sequence of words to the end. Um, and this, you know, in some sense, this is, this is a little strange because we're, we're sort of going off the data manifold. Uh, but I think it at least retains the validity in, in that, like, you know, we're adding, if we're adding incoherent text, um, it's definitely not providing evidence for an incorrect answer. So, like, there still is an obvious correct answer uh, if you're reading the paragraph. Uh, so, concretely, how does this work? Uh, we're basically going to take, again, the question paragraph pair uh, and start by just picking some random common words and adding it to the end. I mean, in all likelihood, this will not change the model's prediction at all. Uh, but now we're going to do a local search thing, where we uh, pick a word at random, uh, replace it with another word, and that will be either like another word from our list of common words, um, or we might just copy a word directly from the question, right? Because 
we know that you know, adding question words is a good way to sort of attract the model's attention. Um, and then we just sort of keep doing this over and over again. Um, and eventually, we'll stop at a point where, you know, in many cases, the model has been convinced to answer something that is no longer the correct answer. Uh, so I think the, the interesting thing about this experiment is that models are doing really bad now. So um, this, this best model that was getting 80% accuracy, uh, if we just add 10 carefully chosen words to the end, it's at like 2.7. Yes, sir? Uh, so do you keep add perturbing till a model gets it wrong, or do you do a fixed number of perturbations and then evaluate? Yeah, so we, uh, for each example, we will keep, yeah, basically we'll, we'll keep searching until either the model gets it wrong or we hit some like maximum number of steps. So, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, so, uh, so the takeaway here I think is that like, if you, if you, especially like if you, if you run the search for, for long enough, um, we, we're basically able to fool almost any model uh, with, with just adding a few of these uh, carefully chosen words. Um, but going back to, to our inspiration, I think there's one thing that's sort of a little, um, oh sorry, yeah. Uh, so I'm kind of wondering whether this is really a function of the fact that most squad models incorporate some sort of attention. So, as you add more words into your word salad that are related, you're going to have some distribution over words in your entire paragraph for which your word salad is uh, in, important. Mm -hmm. now, I was wondering if you had any like ideas about whether there's uh, architectural ways that you might think of fixing that. I see. Um, so I, I guess you're saying that because when you do attention, you like normalize across the whole document. Right, you're, yeah, you're so, so pulling away. as soon as you have yeah. some words which are in the question in your word salad, mm -hmm. they're going to, like by definition, they must have high, high similarity. So yeah. it's gonna draw, um, like, uh, and I was just, that's- Yeah, uh, like, yeah, uh, that definitely that makes more. sense. Um, and I, I guess maybe a natural thing is like, what if you have like a multi-headed attention or, yeah, or, perhaps, or you like scale um, scale the 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 activations from from your, the output of your big matrix multiplication for this attention by some like uh, perplexity score of the. Uh, anyway, I maybe we can talk yeah. about this later, but yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, that is. I, I guess I don't know how if, if folks here might have better ideas than me. Like I, I I have in fact always been a little bothered by the fact that attention always normalizes across the whole document, because it seems like, in many cases, there are probably multiple words that are, in fact, relevant, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, and, and so maybe this is, maybe this is just sort of one sort of example of why you need to be able to, like, at the beginning at least, like, look at multiple possible candidates, and, uh, yeah, instead of just focusing on one. Um, yeah, so, um, right, so I, I guess another, another reason why um, this, this might not be entirely convincing is uh, if you look at like, what, what these uh, examples actually look like, um, most of it can be explained like, like, sort of like we were saying with the simple observation that, okay, we just added a bunch of words that were in the question and like the attention, again, right, like the, the model knows that question words are important, we've added a ton of question words um, and therefore it sort of focuses on there and, and picks some answer that's near all those words. So the last question we were sort of interested in is, you know, is there a way to sort of have, like, like how can we get at, find some sort of even stranger looking uh, adversarial examples? Um, so the way we did this is there's an, we have another technique called add common, which is uh, basically the same thing as what I just showed you uh, with one big difference. So again, we're gonna add common word, we're gonna pick a word at random, uh, but now we're only going to allow replacement with another common word. Um, and so this is sort of to, to prevent us from doing sort of cheap things by just like adding the names of people who show up in the question, stuff like that. Um, okay, yeah, and again, we'll, we'll, we'll keep running this search uh, until the model gets this wrong. Um, and here we see that like this, this technique definitely isn't as effective, right? So accuracy goes from about 80 to maybe like 50, uh, 53 for the BIDAP ensemble model. Uh, but there's still like a significant fraction of cases that it's getting wrong in this regime. And it's sort of like fun for me to just like look at 
uh, what was happening in these error cases. So, so some of them are sort of, again, maybe they're just these like common words, you know, like after and then um, that are getting added. Um, there's uh, some sort of like topicality. So like if the question is about markets, you add the word business, uh, and that seems relevant. Um, there, there's uh, like well, one one thing I think that that our our work and other works has hypothesized is that these these models seem to be very good at at looking for cues about answer types. So here's a question that says where, uh, and in the distracting text we added this uh, the word near, which often takes a location as a as an argument. Uh, and then there's also like fun stuff like this. So here we added distracting text, and it actually predicted something that was just in a different part of the paragraph. Um, and if you look what's happening here, uh, the correct answer was actually at the very end. And when we added this text, it somehow changed the score for the question at the, the, like, the, that span at the very end. Um, and so then the model wound up predicting uh, something that was much earlier in the document. So it's basically just like a lot of sort of weird, weird sort of behaviors that we can expose um, by doing these sorts of perturbations. Yeah. I'm curious if you always add these distractors in the, towards the end of mm -hmm. the document, so that might kind of um, uh, disproportionately affect RNN-based models, which tend to, um, you know, put more weight on the sentences that come towards the end. Uh, I see. Um, I think most of the models we were doing would. It would you would like build some sort of representation and then do attention over it uh, over the like hidden representations from each part. So I don't think they would. I wouldn't expect them to be biased in that way. Uh, like they're, do they're you biased. try like adding these distractors anywhere else? Yeah. So I'll show you. Uh, we had an experiment where we added stuff to the beginning. Um, I guess the reason why we tend we wanted to do stuff either at the beginning or end. Um, was because if, if you if you add stuff in the middle, you run a greater risk of breaking any sort of like coreference or other sort of uh, discourse things. Um, if you add it, uh, yeah, if you add it to the beginning of the end, you at least make sure you preserve all the meaning of the original paragraph. Cool. Okay, so I've talked a lot about. Uh, yes, sorry. Have you tried uh, adding this to also training set and see how does it works? Yeah, so we're gonna do that right now. <laughs> OK, yeah, so uh, exactly. So I talked a lot about how to break these systems. Um, what can we do to actually try to fix this? And, and like you just said, uh, one natural thing to try is, OK, we can also add these sorts of things at training time. All right, so here's what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to run this whole uh, add sent pipeline from before uh, that generates these distracting sentences. Uh, because we're doing on a whole training set now, we're not going to do this final step of also crowdsourcing to like remove some errors, but this is still like a pretty good approximation of the types of uh, adversarial sentences that will be seen at test time. Uh, and then we're just going to add, uh, basically augment the training set uh, with uh, examples that have the paragraph with this thing appended to the end. Um, and at first, the signs, uh, it's actually pretty promising, right? So uh, just to recap, on the left, we have the model trained on the standard training data, and it has this huge gap between uh, the original and uh, the adversarial uh, test data. Uh, meanwhile, on the right, we have the adversarially trained model, and we see that you know, it basically has the same performance on the regular data, uh, but now it's much better at the adversarial data. Yes? The, the test set is still like um, adversary. You're still adding the adversary examples in the same way Yes. you did yes. before. Yeah, well, but good question. Um, right, so. But OK, so has the model really learned the right thing, especially because we're doing the exact same type of adversarial thing at training and testing? <coughs> so here's, here's the, uh, a, a new thing. We're going to do a modified version of the adversary, which number one, add sentences to the beginning instead of the end. Um, and number two, we're just going to use a different set of fake answers. Right? So before, uh, for example, if the original answer was a location, we mapped it like to Chicago. And now we'll just map it all to, to Stockholm or something. Um, and uh, when you do this, we, we, we come to the conclusion that the adversarial training hasn't actually helped that much. Because with just these two very small changes to how we're doing uh, generating the adversarial examples at test time, um, the adversarially trained model is now doing um, almost as badly as, as the original model. It maybe has gotten like a couple points higher. Um, but I think the takeaway here is that it's really easy to overfit to a given type of adversary. right? So, 
if you can anticipate exactly the types of weird things you might see at test time, you can throw that into your training data. Um, but that doesn't at all guarantee that you'll be robust to even you know, very similar types of adversaries at test time. And this is a pattern that's also been observed uh, both in computer vision and with other work in uh, machine translation as well. Um, okay, so sort of the overall summary for this section. Uh, number one, systems are brittle. We can distract them by exposing the, the ways in which they're overly stable. Um, and adversarial training itself is also brittle, right? You can overcome it by just having a slightly different adversary. Uh, so yes. adding to the beginning seems similar to adding to the end in, sen in the sense that um, most of these systems are using RNNs and bidirectional RNNs, so it's like they're catching the same thing almost. So when the system is brittle by adding the sentence at the end, at the test time, and it breaks, it, um, I would expect that it also breaks when you add a new kind of adversarial sentence at the beginning. So um, I was wondering if there's a, like a better way to like add less bias in um, introducing adversarial examples. Like for example, like if you randomly inject one sentence at one random location, uh, both at um, like when you're building your training set, yeah. and also at test set, you can add like a, another random sentence at random location and see how it works. I think that's yeah. less um, bias. Right. Um, so I think you definitely can do that. Like you can sure you can try to yeah add the distracting sentence at different points during training. Um, but but again, like I think this is more sort of a demonstration that like even if you do that. There's going to be other types of attacks that aren't even adding distracting sentences or doing something else, right? And um, yeah, so so I, I think in general it's, it seems very hard to get guarantees to, to cover all the adversaries. Okay, cool. Um, cool. So I'll move on to uh, work uh, from ACL about unanswerable questions, and this is all uh, joint work with my colleague Pranav Stanford. Um, oh, sorry. Yes. I, I don't know if you're this part. Yeah. So I'm kind of surprised that we need to go all the way to finding adversarial examples in order to show the brittleness of the QE system. Uh, because if you just move to a different domain uh, or general text, you would clearly see the kind of errors that we're making uh, in free fall. So, and most of the time when we're using uh, real information systems, it's in a more of a collaborative setup, not a competitive setup, where like the machine is trying to cooperate with the human to so that the human can be more efficient. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if um, if you think there are, if this if you think this is the best way to go to uh, to, to improve the brittleness of, of the reading comprehension systems as opposed to trying to resolve or understand better understand how this brittleness comes from using more natural setups. Yeah, I think that's a so maybe, maybe I'll I'll hold that question. I'll I'll come back to this idea of, of testing on different domains uh, in, in the last section. But yeah, I, I agree. That that's also a very, uh, very nice test. Like yeah, I think in some sense it's, it's a much more natural thing than than this adding distracting sentences. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. So answer these uh, unanswerable questions. And actually, sorry, uh, stepping back and, and thinking about this overstability issue. Right. Like I, I kept on saying that the issue is that models are not sensitive to um, these small changes that actually. Uh, drastically change the meaning of a piece of text, um, right? And, and in fact, like basically all that was encoded in this one step where we changed a couple words in the question uh, to, to make it a completely different question. And then we sort of had to jump through all these weird hoops and create a distracting sentence and then add it to the paragraph somehow. Um, and that was all because in the original squad data set, right, like every paragraph was guaranteed to have a correct answer, right? Like, so if we just asked, for example, ask the question that's boxed, um, that would just be like an invalid input, right? Like the squad system just has no way of even knowing that this question, you know, is irrelevant to the paragraph that it was given. Um, and so, in fact, uh, we decided to try to address this issue with squad 2.0. Um, so this is the, the new version of the squad data set, and what we've added is we've kept all the original answerable questions, like, you know, what city is the capital of Victoria? Uh, but now we've also crowdsourced a bunch of unanswerable questions, which look similar to the answerable ones. Right? So, for example, the question, what city is the capital of Australia, you know, looks very similar to this question that's answerable, but in fact, the paragraph 
uh, doesn't say what the capital of Australia is. So um, the model, again, when given the original question, it should just say Melbourne. Uh, when it's given this new question, it should be able to output a special token that says uh, no answer here. Um, yeah, and again, just sort of uh, on motivation, like I said, so some, some of the motivation has this goal of taking the original distracting sentence-based uh, adversarial evaluation and trying to turn it into something a little more natural, right? So now we can, we can just change a couple words in the question. Uh, we've changed the correct answer from 1700 to no answer, but if we really believe that the systems are overly stable, they will continue to predict uh, 1700. Um, and I guess the other sort of interesting thing when you're adding unanswerable questions, I think it opens a door for a lot more ways you can sort of frame other tasks as question answering. So there's a nice paper from uh, Levy et al. that did this for relation extraction. Uh, so you know, so if you're trying to sort of populate a knowledge base of who was educated where, uh, you can turn a lot of these queries into questions, like Albert Einstein was a student at what school? Um, you generate this paragraph, which says, uh, or sorry, and you retrieve a paragraph, uh, let's say, from the web, uh, and in some cases, right, that paragraph actually will contain uh, a valid answer, and so everything is good. Um, but sometimes, you know, in many cases for relation extraction, you're going to find these candidates that don't actually uh, that, that don't actually have the, the relationship between the two entities, um, and you need to be able there again to have the, the model say, no, this is not actually an instance of the relation. Cool. Uh, so just I'll, I'll go briefly through uh, what we did to collect the data set. Um, uh, just like in the original squad, this is uh, heavily based on, on crowdsourcing, and we're also going to make use of the fact that squad 1.1 is just sort of sitting around and, and reuse it. So we're going to take all the same paragraphs from squad, uh, and we're also going to take actually the original questions from squad, and we'll show both of these to uh, the crowd workers. And so the, the reason we might show these uh, original questions is first just for them to sort of get a sense of like what are even like reasonable questions to ask. Um, and also, I think this naturally sort of biases the process towards um, them writing questions that are similar to the answerable ones, which is kind of what we wanted if we're trying to get at this overstability issue. Uh, so the crowd workers write a few questions, uh, like, like, like this. Um, and we also ask them to, to make sure that there is what we call a plausible answer for each question. So what that means is that there has to be some span in the paragraph that sort of like type checks with the question, right? So the question is asking how populous is something and the like second largest is a reasonable string there. And, and the reason we do this is to make sure that, you know, you can't, the models can't sort of cheat by saying that, oh, you know, nothing even looks like it could be the answer to this question, uh, therefore, like, it, it, it's obviously not answerable, right? We, we want to force the models to do more work there. Um, okay, so just in summary, we've collected about 150K, we're, we're now at 150K total examples. Um, and we have about a 50-50 split at, at test time of unanswerable and answerable questions. Uh, give you a sense of, of what sort of phenomena show up in this data set. Uh, some of them are, are, are maybe things you might expect, so things like antonymy show up, um, and things where you have to like you know swap out uh, where, you, where like the question is swapped out one entity for a different entity. Um, and there's also sort of a, a, a tale of kind of interesting things. So one one thing that we see a bit is these sorts of like subject-object reversals, um, other syntactic rearrangements, right? So here, the paragraph says dendritic cells are named for the resemblance to neuronal dendrites, and then the question sort of flips it and asks what is named for the resemblance to dendritic cells? Um, and then you have even you know, fun stuff like this. Uh, so there's like a building that has an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Uh, does that imply that athletes train there, like Olympic athletes train there? <laughs> like maybe, right, but it's not, it's not actually entailed so this is, again, uh, this question, again, is, is not actually answerable. Um, OK, so, you know, so as you saw, there are some sort of, sort of like trick questions in the data set. So we wanted to make sure that this is still doable by humans. Um, so we just got votes from, uh, we had basically crowd workers do this exact same task. Uh, they were given, again, the same mix of answerable and, an, um, answerable and unanswerable questions. Um, and and uh, they actually can do quite well. So uh, we did have to, to, to get the, the best results. We did realize that it was better to sort of pool multiple people and have them do like majority vote. Uh, because you know, it's easy for any one person to sort of get tripped up by some of these trick questions. Uh, but I think it's a demonstration that humans like, can do very well in this data set if they're being careful. Um, OK, so now that we've seen how, uh, how these um, 
yeah, sorry, now that we've seen how humans do, uh, we took some systems, including, uh, you know, well, I guess it's all stuff from here. <laughs> we have the, the BIDAP model, we have the document QA model, and we have uh, also the version uh, plus ELMO. And um, so across the board, uh, for, for our baselines, we see that these, these models, even though they're doing very well on squad 1.1, uh, when we have them do squad 2.0, and even though they're equipped with the ability to also predict like no answer, uh, they're doing significantly worse here uh, compared to humans. And so, you know, the human machine gap uh, was maybe like five points between the, the best model we tested in humans, and it's now something like 23 uh, on, on our new data set. Uh, another sort of sanity check we wanted to do. Uh, was, you know, can you answer, can you figure out the question that's unanswerable without reading the paragraph, right? So like, we know that there's uh, some bias that can creep into these, these crowdsourced data sets. Um, and so we ran um, sort of some, some sort of simple baselines. Uh, we ran the fast text uh, and also just a SVM with, with uh, up to three grams. Um, and so if you're doing this binary classification task, which is like, is the question answerable or not? And I only look at the question. Uh, you can get, there's some signal there, you can get about 60% when the you know, majority baseline is right around 50. Um, I guess it's worth noting that if you just take those, those models I showed you before that are actually trying to do the reading comprehension task and just uh, see if they think the question is answerable or not, uh, they're getting, you know, doing much better, up to like 72% binary accuracy. Um, I think when we looked at the data, like there's definitely some things that, that I think you, we're not entirely happy with. So. For example, negation words are a pretty good sign that the question is unanswerable. Like negation words do also occur in, in answerable questions, but just the frequencies are are, are much different. Um, you see, like antonyms of common question words. So questions tend to ask things like, "What was the biggest x?" or "What was the first x?" Right. So you see things like smallest and last show up. Um, but but I think overall these features are are pretty rare, which which means that uh, like overall you can't get. Uh, you're not doing that well predicting with the question words alone. Okay. Um, the last thing for this section is, you know, we went through all this effort to crowdsource and generate these unanswerable questions, uh, but there's also ways to do the same thing automatically, right? So uh, one option is to use a sort of a, a TFIDF-based approach. So basically, you take existing questions that for which you know the answer, you just find other paragraphs that seem to have high word overlap but don't actually contain the correct answer and then that pair is a pair that's, that uh, is not answerable. Um, or you can just use the rule-based approach like we did for the distracting sentence work. Um, cool. and, and the issue there is that, that both of these are, are just sort of result in less challenging data sets, right? So you can take these and merge them with the original squad data, um, but the models are doing a lot better here. So I think it, it is a sort of a nice demonstration for us that like, you know, going through all the effort of crowdsourcing uh, did actually help us generate a data set that was more challenging. And was the proportion of uh, unanswerable questions here the same? Yeah, yeah, we kept it all the same. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, okay, I guess I'll, I'll mention that uh, since the data set released, like maybe a little more than two months ago, there's already been a lot of progress. We're now at like 74 F1. I think there's still a significant gap here between uh, computers and humans. Cool, so, um, so just to sum up, so we have this more challenging version of squad, um, and I think I'm really actually just more excited about this format of, of having these unanswerable questions, right? It means you can't just sort of rank all the possible candidates, you have to actually figure out like, is this answer actually entailed uh, by the text? Um, it, it enables model, models that can handle these sorts of queries, seem to have broader flexibility to things like relation extraction, and it makes it a lot easier to craft sort of adversarial inputs by just like changing some words questions here for you. Yes? For the, uh, I don't know if you did this analysis, but for the questions which the any of the models get wrong on mm -hmm. squad 2.0, do the answers type check with the correct type of the, if, um, if, in, in theory, like if the question I was see. answerable, do they even correct? extract an uh, answer which has the correct kind of type in it. So yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we didn't run that specific analysis, but what, what we did measure is, I don't really remember the numbers, but so what we did measure was, uh, I mentioned that 
the crowd work for us to annotate a plausible answer, right? So that's basically like one thing in the paragraph that has the correct type. Uh, and I think, if I remember correctly, it was like roughly like half or maybe like 60% of the time when the models made errors, they were answering something that they were answering that span, or at least something that overlapped that span. Good. Um, yeah. But the, the, right, the fraction that type checks is going to be higher because there's other things that also type Yeah. Checks. I was just wondering if one possible way to, to use a model trained on squad, the original version of squad, is just to run it and then do some sort of way of seeing, like, is this a person for a who question? Is this a, and then if if the answers that it extracts are just kind of garbage, then you can just immediately know it's not answerable. Right, um, yeah. But, um, but, yeah. Yeah, but I think that, that, right, so I think that's something we anticipated, that's why we had this plausible answer. Good, that's great. Yeah. Um, all right, so on to, this is sort of more sort of uh, work in progress stuff. Um, and also it's just joint work with uh, another great collaborator, Braden. It's also at Stanford. Um, and I guess our, our original inspiration here was like, uh, so again, like you, like you were saying, right? Like, uh, you would like to be able to collaborate with a QA system uh, to do to accomplish tasks. And maybe one thing you might actually want to do is you would like to build a, build a system uh, using QA as an interface, right? So let's say you know you're just like pop down in in this uh, transit company. Uh, and you want to build an app that, that uh, handles these sort of user queries, right? The user is asking for bus tickets, um, and the server needs to be able to produce, you know, understand this, hand back the correct tickets. Um, one thing, uh, one thing that you could do is you could try to convert this into QA, right? So a human might just write some rules that say, well, okay, so, you know, what the computer should do is it should try to answer the question, where is the bus going to? Uh, find the answer in um, in the user's utterance. And then fill in sort of the appropriate slot, or you know, issue the appropriate API column, right? You can imagine doing this for a lot of different types of slots, like how many adult tickets are needed, uh, and so on, right? So the proposal is that we would like to um, evaluate uh, QA systems that have been trained in terms of how well they can, uh, like how useful they can be to actually solving these sorts of uh, we call it reductions, right? So we've taken task in that case, sort of uh, slot filling, and turned it into a QA task. Um, yeah, and and so there's there's I think a lot of nice advantage to this, there's sort of a natural diverse distribution of tasks that you know, over the years people have decided were worth working on. Um, and I think it's also sort of important to think about the case where you're forcing systems to generalize in a zero shot or, or maybe few shot fashion. Right? That seems to get at this issue that, um, that systems might do well on a particular data set by overfitting whatever's happening in that data set. We want to make sure that they're actually understanding you know, generally the task of, of what it means to answer questions. Um, okay, so concretely we, we uh, did made reductions for three different domains. Well, actually we really made two, because one of them was made for us. This is the relation extraction stuff again. Uh, and here we they, the, the, the previous work already just had question templates for a bunch of different relations, so we could just borrow those um, to reduce relation extraction to question answering. Um, we also did uh, slot filling on ATIS. So here the task is, you know, you're given an utterance like this, and you're, you're trying to output this list of slot value pairs. And for any given utterance, many of the slots will probably uh, not actually be mentioned in the utterance, right? So again, this is where having a model that can say no answer uh, is very important. You want it to be able to answer questions like, you know, if the flight goes to what city, the answer is Miami. Uh, when does the flight leave? Uh, paragraph doesn't say, and so you should be able to say, like, no answer. Uh, and third, we, we played around with, this is a bit of a different uh, flavor of reduction, we played around with uh, semantic parsing. Uh, so here the task is you're given a table that comes from uh, Wikipedia, so it's just like a HTML table, uh, and an utterance that's basically a question that can be answered by doing some computation over the table. Um, and sort of the, the standard, the, the classic approach for this is you would uh, try to generate a bunch of candidate logical forms right, uh, that represent the meaning of the utterance and can be executed on the table to return um, the correct answer. Right? So you might, one candidate might just be to like, count the number of networks that have one of these names, which is, of course, incorrect. Uh, you would want the candidate that's second on the list, which actually finds the owner of uh, the network that is Azteca 13. And again, we can try to turn this into a uh, QA 
like a text-based uh, QA problem. Uh, and here we're actually going to keep the question the same. So the question is going to be the original input. And we're going to take all these candidate logical forms and write them in some sort of like pseudo natural language format that says you know, like two is the number of network names that is as Teca 13 or as Teca 7. Um, so it's probably not ideal. And I think, I think one thing going forward where we, we might think about is for an actual evaluation of the um, field models, you probably want something that looks more natural than this. Uh, but but these, these currently are, are just generated sort of automatically based on some rules. And they sort of at least, you know, at, at approximately capture the meaning of, of what each of these candidates means. Um, and so we'll take all of these new question paragraph pairs uh, and basically ask the QA system, like, is the answer, the, like, is there an answer to this question based on the paragraph, right? And so the, the correct candidate, which is the second one, you know, we, we want the QA model to realize, yes, TBS tech is actually the correct answer. Um, okay, so for some of those initial experiments, uh, we again took this uh, document QA with ELMO model trained on Squaw 2.0. Um, and yeah, so, so let, let, let's, see, let's see how we're doing. So there's some like very simple baselines um, for these tasks. And we are, we are getting like some mileage out of the QA system. So we can see that uh, we're actually beating a pretty reasonable baseline on the, on the relation extraction, which is basically you train, they trained on some relations and tested on other relations. Uh, we seem to do, do well from training on squad instead. Um, and we definitely get some mileage out of like uh, resolving some ambiguities in ADIS and wiki tables. Um, at the same time, if you just sort of train a model directly on the, on the data distribution, you're going to do a lot better. Um, and so what we wanted to ask is sort of like, you know, how, how good are we actually doing? Um, I think the answer is that there's still, there's still kind of a long way to go here. So for example, on ADIS, uh, the, the, the QA system on the reduction can get like end task performance of like 82 F1. And if you write four rules, and these rules are like, if a, uh, these rules are all to just uh, determine whether a city is like a starting city or an ending city, and the rules like, if the word from happens before the city name, it's a starting city. <laughs> uh, some simple things like that, you can actually get you know, essentially the same performance, um, right? And this is just sort of a common thing that emerges. Right? And this is sort of a cool, I think, example of, of what happens when you look at these other tasks. You see that you know, for this particular task on ADIS, it's like very important to be able to distinguish arrival and departure. Um, and sometimes the QA model can do it well, but it's not really. Um, it seems like it also makes some just inexplicable mistakes uh, sometimes, right? So here, the paragraph says, um, List, list times for flights that are leaving after six, um, but then the model predicts that the answer to when does the flight arrive should be six. Um, so, so stuff like that, which, um, yeah, like you know, maybe, in certainly like in, in data sets like squats seem less important, but if you try to apply it here, it's something very important. Uh, what's the fraction of no answer on, on these tasks? It's probably much higher than fifty fifty. Uh, yes, for this it is it is much higher than fifty. Um, I guess I will, um, yeah, so, so I guess there's, there's some details here. So actually, how we, how we made the system, uh, like we also wanted to account for the fact that like, you know, the data has a certain way of annotating like which are the correct spans. Like you should annotate the city and not like from city or something like that. And so we actually just like pre-computed a bunch of, of spans in the paragraph that were like possible answers um, and then used, um, use the model to sort of rank for each of those possible answers, like which, uh, does it make more sense as the answer to the arrival city or like the departure city or something, yeah. So it was, um, yeah, I, I, guess, I guess the point is that it was just a, a slightly different setup, but yeah, you're right, there, there's a lot of things that are not right. So how do you do training for these uh, uh, reading compression systems? Or do you, do you use uh, first squad and then fine tune, or do you not use squad anymore? No, we just we only use squad. You only use so that's the that, that's the thing, right? So we're we, we wanted to. I guess the argument we were trying to make was that like the, the true test of understanding is if you can do is some sort of if you can do zero shot generalization. Um, practically, probably fine tuning makes sense, and that's a, something when I go back to Stanford, I want to play around with more because um, it was sort of stuff we worked on right up until <laughs> I came out here. Uh, yeah, definitely. I, I think practically you can 
probably assume you can fine tune on, I don't know, like a handful of examples at least. Um, yeah, and, and I, ma I imagine it should actually help quite a bit. I don't know how many, I guess it'll be interesting to see like how many examples you need to become competitive with like real systems. So this means the comparison you did before is very unjust to this. Yes. Uh, I agree, yeah. yeah. Which is, which is, yeah, like in, in some sense, this table is like completely unsurprising. It's like we beat some dumb baselines and we were worse than the real systems <laughs> that were optimized for this task. And so, th so that's why I'm trying to go into understanding a little like what are, what are the, uh, what, are, what are basically some better points of comparison. So for here, it seems like, well, if you write four rules, you're actually doing about as well as the QA model. Um, and then for relation extraction, um, what we did to sort of get a, get a better sense of, of a reasonable baseline is, uh, I actually took, these are sort of the five relations within this data set of maybe like 100 and some relations. These are the five relations that the QA model is doing the best on. Um, and for each of those, I just wrote some rules. So uh, in some cases, like for, if you're detecting native language, you can just have sort of a, a, a dictionary. So like a list of known languages and then uh, predict that language if you see it, otherwise don't predict anything. Uh, for other things like author, there was just like a few regex patterns. I think at most like five for each of these uh, that are like you know, uh, you know, title, comma, written by, you know, and so on. Um, and again, it seems like you know you can get pretty far, and in, in, in most cases farther, by by just writing a few of these rules um, than using the QA system, right? So I think again, this points to this is maybe a, a more fair comparison. It also points to some some. Uh, that definitely room for improvement on, on the QA side. Um, one thing that we found that consistently popped up was that the QA model um, would sort of over trigger on things that were sort of somehow, seemed somehow related, but, but weren't exactly right. So for example, for the relation of like, who is uh, someone's mother, uh, you, you have things like, this is maybe a hard case where Thomas Rolfe married someone who was the daughter of someone else, and so the, the model predicted the, his wife's father, I guess. Um, but then there's also stuff like this. So um, who's this person's mother? It, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, it actually answers like her twin sister. <laughs> uh, it is disappointing because like the person's mother is in fact uh, further down, but I guess it's like farther away from from uh, their name. Um, and then there's stuff like this, right? So then it predicts the husband. So it seems like. What's happening, and I think we, I saw this in, in a few of these different relationships that involve families, for instance, that like all these all these terms are sort of you know somehow related, definitely co-occur a lot, and so the model is is sort of getting mixed up as to what exactly defines the mother versus the husband and so on. Um, cool. Yeah. So just to wrap up this section, um, evaluating on these sort of reductions, uh, I, th I think it's interesting because it, it yields this very natural distribution of QA problems. Uh, currently, with the QA systems we have, if you just pre-train them and try to generalize zero shot, um, they're not doing as well as, as maybe some regexes. Um, but I, I think going forward, I think there's, there's a lot of interesting room for both thinking about just how to do better training procedures on, on, on more data, uh, and also fine tuning, like you said, um, to, to tasks. Um, and I think one sort of interesting thing that I, I'm, I'm curious about is, you know, what, what if we just have like a, a really big suite of these tasks, and you actually have tasks that are hidden uh, away in some sort of test set, and, and the test is like, how can you, how do you zero shot generalize to these tasks that you don't even, haven't even uh, seen before? Um, cool. So I'll just uh, see, in the last few minutes. I'll just quickly go over uh, some ideas for future work we've been thinking about. Um, and so going going back to this this. Uh, uh, the earlier discussion of like, oh, if you want to build a dialogue system, you can convert it to QA. Um, I guess there was one thing that was sort of missing from that picture, which is that there's actually a human in the loop who can be writing these questions and sort of adapting the questions to what the QA model is going to bad at, right? So let's say you're trying to do relation extraction for some like random U tailish relationship for which you don't have any, any data, right? So like what lake was created by some dam, for instance. Um, uh, right, so you would write this question uh, run it on you know, a bunch of Wikipedia articles, let's say, uh, and the computer will give you back predictions. Right? And maybe, maybe you decide, okay, that was a good question, uh, but there were some, some things I missed. So maybe I'll try to write some other question like this. Um, but then there's this, this nice sort of feedback loop, right? So maybe, maybe this question is just like, for whatever 
our reason is structured in a way that the training model is bad at handling, you decide this is a bad question, you remove it. Um, and then on the flip side, maybe, maybe the first question was good, but it also over-triggered on things that weren't even lakes, right? So maybe it, over, it started answering like the river that the dam is blocking instead. And so you can also write these sort of correction questions that say like, well, uh, if, if there's an answer to this question, it's actually not an instance of innovation I care about, um, and so on, right? So the, the idea is that even though these QA systems aren't perfect, um, if you have a human in the, in the loop who can sort of uh, look at what the, how the QA model is doing and can understand the limitations, you might be able to build um, a, a more effective system. Um, and the other idea, and this is you know, part of the, inspired in part by, by some work here, um, the, go, going back to this idea that like partial matches seem to be a very good signal um, in many cases, uh, what we would like to do instead, though, right, is have models that that build what I'm calling, for lack of a better term, like some sort of like derivation or some sort of proof, right? Um, and so again, you can think of this uh, much like in the semantic ILP case uh, as these these links where you're trying to link various words in the question uh, towards in the in the paragraph. Um, and then also trying to link various words in the paragraph to the answer. Um, and so this is something we're currently sort of investigating with, with how we can do it on the squad 2.0. Uh, I think one other interesting thing that sort of falls out from this framework is that like, uh, for in the case of unanswerable questions, it's sort of a natural thing to do, which is that if you can find such a derivation, then the question's unanswerable. And if you can't, then it's unanswerable, uh, which is sort of, I think, natural setting. Um, and also trying to try and figure out like is there a way to like automatically learn what sort of associations are good, or maybe is it better to rely on sort of um, pre pre-made annotations uh, from out the subsystems and maybe some combination. I think these are all things uh, I'm very interested in. But hopefully the end goal is some model that is less uh, prone to these sort of overstability issues because it actually looks at all the words in the question um, and tries to find evidence that all of them are sort of being satisfied. Cool, so I'll just, uh, I guess I'll just wrap up there and take, take some questions. I'd like to, again, uh, give big thanks to Percy, uh, Pranav, and Braden, as well as uh, all the folks back at Stanford NLP Group. Uh, yeah, thank you very much.